Well, we welcome you to our Wednesday in the Word Bible study. I guess that is loud enough. That's good. Uh, can you hear that, Will? Does that sound all right? Very good. I uh, decided I'd move back a little bit closer to the crowd here uh, today. We've been out a couple of weeks, but we're back at it again today. And glad that uh, you are here. We welcome Michael, uh, who's our guest today, all the way from Zambia. Uh, he works, uh, he's the right hand man of Ken Buckner. Our missionary there serving and uh, Michael's in the States for a little while and so we're glad that he's here today the guest of Ms. Donna. Over breakfast one morning a woman said to her husband, I bet you don't know what day it is. Of course I do, he answered indignantly as he slammed the door and drove to his office. At 11 o'clock the doorbell rang. The wife answered and there at her front door was a UPS driver and in his hand was a box containing 12 red roses. Later at 2 p.m., there was another knock at the door. This time it was a delivery box of wonderful chocolates. Eventually, the husband came home and tired after a hard day's work. His wife greeted him by saying, first the flowers, then the chocolates. I've never had a more wonderful Groundhog Day in all my life. <laughs> well, it is Groundhog Day. Did he, did he see a shadow or not see a shadow? Does anyone know? We're going to have more cold weather. Well, you know, I've... You know, I know that um, groundhogs do not have, uh, you know, a, a morality about them, but I do believe the groundhogs are just liars. I, I just don't think they just get it right. But anyway, uh, take your Bibles, if you will, and turn to the book of Exodus chapter 11. Exodus chapter 11. And we're going to be looking at chapters 11 and 12, uh, getting into 13, but uh, especially 11 and 12 today. The title of this Bible study is Principles from the Passover. Uh, we are looking at the life of Moses, and uh, we come today to one of the uh, seminal events uh, in the Old Testament, and that is Passover. Uh, in fact, uh, the Lord's Supper that we celebrate today comes right out of Passover. And one of the uh, largest pictures of salvation one of the most complete pictures of God's salvation uh, is in the Passover feast uh, that Jews still celebrate today and that we celebrate the Lord's Supper. Uh, and that's what we're looking at today. We've been looking at the beginning of Exodus, how that God has been using Moses, the deliverer, to be able to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt. That whole picture uh, is a picture of salvation. People in slavery are going to be set free. And now we're going to look at, well, what is the means? You say, well, the means of their deliverance was all of the plagues. Well, it was, but it was the last plague that in which there was the sacrifice of the lamb that is really going to be the deliverer, uh, the deliverance for the people of Israel. Here's a key truth I want us to look at. In the story of the Passover, we remember God's saving power and grace from generation to generation. We remember God's saving power and grace from generation uh, to generation. Four things I want us to look at, and then we'll look at some lessons. First of all, there is the prediction of the darkness. Turn to Exodus chapter 11. The prediction of the darkness. This is the, in our context of where we are, this is the, the leading up to the last plague. God has told that there are going to be ten plagues upon the Egyptians. And he has said, at the tenth plague, it will be the last one. It will be that one in which Pharaoh will finally cry, Uncle. And he say, I will let the people of Israel uh, go. And so chapter 11 is detailing and setting up everything that we need to know about the prediction of this darkness, prediction of this particular um, last plague. Well, when is it going to occur? Look at verse 4, if you will. And Moses said, Thus says the Lord, about midnight, I will go out into the midst of Egypt. Well, what is the tenth plague? The tenth plague is this. God has announced that throughout the entire land of Egypt, that every firstborn would die. Every firstborn would die. That would be firstborn men, women, of the animals even. All the firstborn throughout the entire land would die as a result of the judgment of God. And so that is the last plague, this plague of darkness uh, that's going to come upon them. And you say, well, why is the, this particular one is the, um, 
Remember, go back to in our history to World War II. And you remember that in the Pacific realm especially, that in World War II, uh, there was Pearl Harbor that led to all of the fighting for the Americans against the Japanese forces. There was the Battle of Midway. And then as the aircraft carriers and things kept getting closer and closer and closer to Japan, there was a progression. There was another step. There was another battle. They kept taking island after island. Finally, they took the island of ok Okinawa, which was actually Japanese territory. And it was there that they stopped. And because of the fierceness of the fighting, President Truman made the decision that we have an atomic bomb. And he said, we, we've got to end this. And that's when the two atomic bombs were dropped on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. And it was that last thing. It was that, it was so horrific. And it was so devastating. And the death and destruction was so pronounced upon the Japanese people that they finally said, we surrender. That's what's happening here. There's been a whole progression of all of these plagues coming. And Pharaoh has ignored all of them. But this one he's not going to ignore. So the Bible says that God's going to send a death angel throughout the land. The firstborn are going to die. It's going to happen about midnight. Who's going to die? Well, verse 5 tells us. He says, the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. A Pharaoh to the firstborn of, from Pharaoh to the slave girl. In other words, it's going to affect every single person. I want you to notice something. That the plague that came upon Israel that this particular plague, they had been protected from all the rest of them, but this particular plague, if Israel did not follow putting the blood on the door, the firstborn of Israel would have died as well. You know what this says? It says that the Egyptians and the Israelites were just as guilty of sin. We think about the judgment coming upon the Egyptians, and yet God did that because of their slavery, but when it came to this particular plague, the Israelites were just as guilty as the Egyptians. The only thing that saved Israel's firstborn from dying was God giving them prescription of putting the blood on the door. If they refused to do that, and I would suspect that there were families that did not do that, their firstborn died just like the Egyptians. So what's going to be the consequence? Verse 6 says, There will be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt. This is going to be so painful that they can't help, uh, but they're going to want to drive the people of Israel out. Where is it going to happen? Well, it says, I will go out, look verse 4, I will go out into the midst of Egypt. Down in verse 7, it says, But not a dog shall growl against any of the people of Israel, neither man or beast, that ye may know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. God does make a dis distinction there, but the death angel is going to go throughout only thing he's going to say to Israel is their prescription of the Passover. Why is this going to happen? He says, that ye may know that the Lord makes a distinction. There is a distinction between those that are covered by the blood and those that are not covered by the blood. That's the only distinction. It is the blood of the Lamb applied to the door that makes them separate, that makes them different. Well, how's Pharaoh going to respond to this? He predicts this as in all of these, your servants, verse 8, shall come down to me, and bow down to me, saying, get out, you and all the people who follow you. And after that, I will go out. He went out from Pharaoh in hot anger. But the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not listen to you, that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh. And the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the people of Israel go out of the land. Pharaoh hears about this plague, knows that it's coming, and yet he says, no. He knows that the death of the firstborn is coming. He's known about all the other nine plagues. And he's fiddled around between, well, maybe you can go, maybe you can't go, but at, at the end of the day, after nine plagues, he's not let Israel go. And he doesn't plan on doing it yet. Death is coming to him. You say, Pharaoh stubbornly refuses to listen to nine warnings of God. 
Here's the tenth warning that death is coming. Pharaoh, your son is going to die. What does Pharaoh do? I'm not going to do it. What? You say, how in the world can someone know or at least hear that the judgment of God is coming and refuse to change his life? Are people different today? Let me ask you this. Is, is, is Jesus coming again one day and is the judgment of God coming upon planet earth again one day? Is it coming? Has He predicted? Has He said? Has He promised? One day I'm coming and I will, when I come, I will bring judgment. Do people listen? What do people do? They go back and they read, people today will go back and read stories like this in the book of Exodus. And here's what they will say. Oh, that didn't really happen. <laughs> you bunch of Christians, you read the Bible and the Bible is just, it's a bunch of fairy stories and myths and it's not true. This never happened. They'll go back and read the book of Genesis and all these books. And, oh, that didn't happen. That, you know, God didn't do that. God didn't kill the firstborn in Egypt and all that. that you know, that's, what, that's some of your fairy stories. And so they, they look at the written record. Say it's a fairy story. Say it's not true. And go on and live their life. I read a passage of Scripture too. It's found in the book of Romans chapter 1. Book of Romans chapter 1 beginning verse 18. Why is it today that when we preach the gospel of Jesus Christ that God's judgment is coming upon every man, woman, and child in this world and that the only way to be saved from God's coming wrath is to know Jesus? Why do they refuse to listen? Well, Romans chapter 1 verse 18 tells us, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. In other words, they don't believe it. For what can be known about God is plain to them. Written in the Word. Because God showed it to them. It's not that they don't have a warning. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things which have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claimed to be wise, <coughs> they became fools. And exchange the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creepy things. Therefore, God gave them up. What does that sound like when you relate that to Pharaoh? What did God do to Pharaoh? Pharaoh hardened his heart. He would not listen. He would not listen. He would not listen. Then what did God do to Pharaoh? God hardened his heart. God set his heart. God hardened him. Where are people today? God has hardened their heart because they have rejected, rejected, rejected. Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their own hearts to impurity, to dishonoring their bodies among themselves. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie, worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator. One day God's patience, which has been clearly predicted, is going to come. Pharaoh had that warning. So do we today. There's a prediction of the darkness that's coming. There's a preparation for departure. Look at chapter 12. Go back to Exodus chapter 12. God now gives the instructions for Moses to give to the people of Israel. First of all, how are they going to be protected from this plague of death of the firstborn that's coming? Well, first of all, they're going to be protected by killing the sacrificial lamb. Read in chapter 12, verses 1 through 7. It says, first of all, this month for you shall be the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. The month of the year in the Jewish calendar is about the month of Nisan. It's about our month 
of March and April, about halfway of March, halfway of April, is our calendar of where this event happens. God rearranges the calendar of Israel and says, from now on, your calendar from now on, that the first month of the year, for us it's January, the first month of the year in the Jewish calendar is the month Nisan, which occurs about April and March, which corresponds with this feast, Passover. Why did God do that? I want you to think about what most of us do with our calendar. What do most people do with their calendar? They have their calendar and they have their plans. And this is my plan for my life. And what I plan, I'm going to do this on this day and this day. And I'm planning this and I'm doing this. And I set aside this time. This is my, in other words, we think in our, most of our thinking that our calendar centers around us. What I plan to do. You know where God's calendar sends around? God's calendar for Israel sent around God. In other words, he told an entire nation of people, your schedule for how you do things, your celebrations, when you will meet, your entire year of what you do as a nation is going to be centered around, God says, my calendar that I give to you. Do you notice how that's a flip? See, it's not my schedule. God says, this is my month. And Passover, this event becomes literally the first event of the year that everything else flows out of Passover. The rest of your calendar, the rest of your time, the rest of your life, the rest of history flows out of Passover. God says, this is the date. He says, what are you going to do? He says, tell the congregation, on the 10th day of the month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses. And he says, and if the household is too small, you'll get families together. and Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You'll take it from the sheep or the goats. And you shall keep it until the 14th day of the month. Notice now, not only do we have the first month of the year, which is now going to be this, but we now have two particular days that God sets out. The 10th day of this month and the 14th day. I want you to go from Passover to Passover. This is the first Passover. I want you to go to the Passover, the last Passover that Jesus celebrated with His disciples. Do you know that when do you know when Jesus on the last week of his life arrived in the city of Jerusalem? What day do we call that? Palm, Palm Sunday. Do you know what day of the year that was? It was the 10th of Nisan. The 10th day in which the lamb was to be set apart was the very day that the lamb of God came to the city of Jerusalem. Do you know when Jesus was crucified? On the 14th day. You say, well, Palm Sunday, that would be, you know, Thursday. Jesus was actually crucified on Friday. Well, let me tell you about that. The Jewish people celebrated Passover on two different days in the city of Jerusalem. And the reason they did that is because the people in the northern area where Jesus was was, was from Galilee area. His disciples and the people in that area always celebrated Passover on Thursday. The people of Jerusalem celebrated Passover on Friday. Now it was still the fourth day and the reason being is that one group celebrated a day from sunrise to sunrise. The other group celebrated a day was from sunset to sunset. So there was a little bit of overlap. So, that when Jesus celebrated the Passover on Thursday night with his disciples, the next day, other people in the city of Jerusalem were also celebrating their Passover day, which was two days of Passover. What time was Jesus Christ, when well, the Bible says that he died, gave up the ghost, and he died? Three o'clock on Friday afternoon. Do you know what the second, the second Passover group was doing at 3 o'clock on Friday afternoon? 
They were taking their Passover lambs and they were sacrificing them and they were killing them because when was the Passover lamb in the book of Exodus to be, to be killed? The Bible says at twilight. Twilight for Jewish calendar is from three o'clock in the afternoon to six o'clock. They had to kill their animals before six o'clock because that would, begin the, that would begin the Sabbath day, that Friday night heading into Saturday. So when Jesus was on Mount Calvary, giving his life, dying as the Lamb of God, outside the city of Jerusalem and outside the temple area, half of the Jewish people of the city of Jerusalem were sacrificing their Passover lambs. Jesus died on the exact day of the Passover. He came in on the 10th. He was sacrificed on the day of Passover four days later on that Friday. You see how everything about Passover is leading up to Jesus, the killing of the sacrificial lamb. There's the eating of the Passover meal. That's the second part of it. Not only were they to sacrifice the lamb, and they were to take the lamb, the blood's lamb, and they were to put that on the door of their house, on the doorway, and in the lentils there would be a, a basin at the bottom that was like kind of collect dirt and whatever, and the blood would go there, cover down the door frame, and would actually go down into the bottom. In other words, the entire door from top to bottom all the way to the floor would be covered by the blood. That's the reason we sing that song, I will pass, I will pass, I will pass over you. That's where Passover comes from, because what happened that night? If the blood was applied to the door and the entire family Everybody that was inside of that, every firstborn child that was inside of that home that was covered by the blood, the angel of death passed by that house and no one was killed. But what happened throughout the rest of the land of Egypt? All the firstborn died. And that crying at midnight was, I cannot imagine the wailing and the crying and the confusion and the sorrow that gripped an entire nation because every firstborn child in the country died who did not have the lamb applied, blood's lamb applied to that door. Well, they also were to roast that lamb, not to break any of its bones. Remember, Jesus never had a bone broken. They were to roast that lamb and then they were to eat it as a family. And then they were to have themselves prepared, have your garments ready, be ready to go because this night you're going to be leaving. So be prepared and ready to go. So let's think about this for a minute and reply it to our Christian life. We're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ whose blood is applied to our life. And in the Passover meal that we celebrate as the Lord's Supper, we take of the bread, and we take of the juice, which is the blood of Jesus, but we also take of the bread. What's the bread? Jesus said, this is my body. We partake of it. He said, this is, this is given for you. It's broken for us. But bread represents, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Not only am I saved from my sins by His blood, but I partake of His substance of who He is. The bread of life as I walk in relationship with Jesus, as I feast upon His Word, as I pray with Him, as I commune with Him, I am being fed daily and I live in that strength. Israel left Egypt with the, blood, with the lamb inside their bellies. Do you understand? Their last meal. Their, their, what they, the energy of that lamb that they were using for body fuel, they were taking their steps to go out. Which tells me I am saved by the blood, but I am sustained daily in my walk by the bread of life, Jesus, and I am to partake of Him and to love Him and to serve Him and to have Him into my life to sustain me. Everything about the Passover is about Jesus. What a great picture of the Christian life. Number three, there's the plague in the darkness. Look at chapter 12, beginning verse 29. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of the livestock, even the animals. 
Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all of his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt. What did God say back in chapter 11 would happen? When this plague comes, there's going to be a great cry in Egypt. For those, therefore, there was not a house where someone was not dead. Then he summoned Moses and Aaron by night. This is Pharaoh and said, Up, go out from among my people, both you and the people of Israel, and go serve the Lord as he has said. Do you remember what Pharaoh said to Moses the first time Moses went to him and said, God has told us to let my people go. What did, what did Pharaoh say? Who is the Lord? Why, why should I let y'all go to go serve God? I don't know this God of yours. Does he know him now? He calls him by name. If you've got your, your Bible there in verse 31... Pharaoh calls God by the name Yahweh, the covenant name of God, not a generic name for God. He calls Him Lord, all capital letters. Pharaoh knows who God is now. Pharaoh knows who Yahweh is now. I want you to notice verse 32. He's not done. This arrogant, pride, prideful king who would not let Israel go, who said, I don't know who God is. I don't know this God that you serve. I'm not going to let my people. Now look at verse 32. Take your flocks and your herds, as you have said, and be gone. What does he say next? And bless me also. Do you know what he's, you know what? Do you know what Pharaoh is asking Moses to do? Moses. Pray for me. Pharaoh doesn't get saved. Don't misunderstand me. He doesn't become a believer and follow God. But I am telling you there was a moment in the proud king of Egypt's life when he knew he had come against the God of heaven and a proud king was humbled on his face and he is crying out to Moses, Moses, would you pray for me? Sometimes we think that the most difficult, prideful, arrogant, hateful people who are so opposed to God that God can never reach them. God can. God can humble. You, you think about that person that you know that's walking in pride and rebellion against God. I'm telling you, God can humble them. God can put them on their face where they say, pray for me. Pray for me. The bad part about Pharaoh is that it was too late. It was a false repentance because he's, in a, he's going to gather himself and we'll see in next week's lesson, he's going to gather his army and he is so still so arrogant and so prideful and still thinks that he's in control. He's going to drive his army into the middle of the Red Sea and God's going to say to him for the last time, I'm done with you. F.B. Meyer writes about that night and I want you to think about this just for a moment. Suddenly the stillness of the night was interrupted by a scream of anguish as a mother rushed out into the night to tell, the, to tell that the angel of death had begun its work. And she was presently answered by the wail of a mother in agony for her firstborn, and this by another and yet another. It was useless to summon priest or physician, magician or courtier. How could they help others who had not been able to ward off death of their own? The maid grinding at the mill and her lady, sleeping under the curtains of silk, were involved in a common sorrow which obliterated all social distinction and made all one. There was not a house where there was not one dead. Even Pharaoh's palace was not exempt. The news spread like wildfire that the heir to the throne was dead, and there was a great cry in Egypt. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. 
Lastly, there's the procession into the desert. Chapter 12, verse 33, the Egyptians were urgent with the people to send them out in haste, for they said, we shall all be dead. If these people of Israel stay here, our firstborn has died. <coughs> Excuse me, the rest of us are going to die. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading bowls being bound up in their cloaks on their shoulders. People of Israel also had done as Moses told them, for they had asked the Egyptian for silver and gold and silver and clothing. For the people had given, for the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so they let them have what they asked. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. Israel went to those that they had served. You say, well, this is, this is, is, is Israel stealing from the Egyptians? No. The people of Egypt were throwing their money at them. They were giving them, get out of here. Remember, Israel had served Egypt as slaves for 400 years and they had never been paid. On that night, Israel got paid. And God plundered the entire nation of Israel, Egypt as they gave their wealth to the nation of Israel. Do you remember how when we get to that point in the, when Israel is in the wilderness and they're given instructions for how to build the tabernacle and all of the gold and all of the stuff that was going to be used to build the tabernacle? Where did it come from? It came from Egypt. They were loaded down with gold and silver. God took care of His people. God plundered the Egyptians. What's some lessons? Find them, we're done. Three simple ones. Salvation comes only through the blood of the Lamb. <coughs> Trust Jesus. Salvation only comes through the blood of the Lamb. Here's what you need to understand. Jesus did not die on the cross of Calvary as the Lamb of God to say, look how much I love you. And he does. Jesus did not die on the cross of Calvary and say, this is an example of how you can live a selfless life, how that you can you know, give your life for others, you know, put others first, you know, love your neighbor better than yourself. Look at my example and live by my example. Jesus did not die on the cross of Calvary to be your example. Jesus died on the cross of Calvary and died in your place. He died as a substitute. He was the lamb that was killed so the family could live. Jesus was the lamb of God slain so that I could not, I could miss having the destroyer of eternal death come by and take my soul. Jesus died as a substitute. The world loves Jesus as an example. Oh, be like Jesus. I mean, the people who don't even claim to be Christians can say, well, why don't you Christians be like Jesus? Problem is, I need a Savior. I can't be like Jesus. I'm a sinner. I need someone to die for my sins, and Jesus did. Number two, salvation comes specifically to those who trust and obey. Follow Jesus fully. How were the households in Israel saved from death? They heard the instructions. They killed the lamb. They roasted and ate it. And they put the blood on the door. And they stayed in the house. Can you imagine some conversations going on? when these instructions were given. Well, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard in my life. Why am I going to kill an animal and put this blood on the door and somehow that's going to save me? Do you understand how when we talk about salvation by faith and Jesus down on the cross of how foolish it sometimes seems to the world? That's dumb. What's that going to do? Think about those that may have heard the message but didn't do it. Well, you know, I'll do it later. I'll do it another night or whatever. You think of all of the excuses and all the things that people could have given that night and not done what was simply asked for them to do. Put the blood on the door. Trust it and obey. That's the salvation by Christ. It's not anything that we do. It's not in the power. It's, in, it's simply in I do what He says I'm to do and that's to trust 
the blood that was shed for me. Number three, redemption and judgment comes at an unexpected moment. Be ready. Although God had told and said the death angel is coming, Pharaoh was still surprised. The people of Egypt were still surprised. Do you think that there will be surprised people on the day when Jesus comes again? Where we have been saying Jesus is coming. There was a man who, story goes, came across a little magic bottle that held a genie. You know the story, how you rub the bottle and the genie comes out and you're giving wishes. He was given a wish. And he said, here's what I would like to have. Genie, I would like to give to me. I want the newspaper from one year in the future. The genie said, you got it? On to his house arrived the newspaper printed one year in the future. He thought, I'll look at all the, I'll look at the scores, I'll look at the stock market, I'll look at all the news and whatever in that newspaper, and I'll be able to figure out about how that I can play the stock market. He said, I'll become a fabulously wealthy man by having this newspaper one year into the future. That year, that's what he did. He read the newspaper, he played the stock market, he was accumulating wealth. And, but he moved from the stock market page to the page in the newspaper where there's the obituary. And as he turned to the obituary in the newspaper one year into the future, he read in the line of the obituary and there was his name. He had spent all of his time wasted on accumulating when the Bible, when the, he was going to die. And his death was set. We've been told God's judgment is coming. Physical death will come or the judgment of God will come when Jesus comes again. We've got to be ready. Do you have the blood applied to your life? One final lesson. Moses told the people of Israel, you tell this every year to your children. This was an object lesson for the family. He told them every year, you tell them what this land means. You tell them what happened on that night. You tell them that the death angel came. You tell them how your father put the blood on the door and you're the firstborn. Your life was spared that night because daddy put the blood on the door. And you tell it and you tell it and you tell it every year and it's a continual every year <coughs> memorial <coughs> that Jews even celebrate today. Why do we have the Lord's Supper? Same thing. When you have the Lord's Supper, and I used to do this with my children when they were small, and they would say, well, you know, why, why can't we have the juice? And why can't we have the bread? Let me tell you about the juice and the bread. The juice is the shed blood of Jesus. The bread is the broken body of Jesus that we're to partake of. You can't take of it until the blood of Jesus has been applied to your life, until you trusted Jesus as your Savior, until you understand that Jesus died for you, then when you understand what the Lord's Supper is about, then you can partake of it. It's one of the greatest tools that we have as parents to teach the gospel right in front of our children. A living example of the gospel. Do you know the Lamb? Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your Word. Thank you for teaching us. Lord, thank you for this lesson from the book of Exodus and the life of Moses, the Passover. Thank you, Jesus, that when John the Apostle saw you, Lord Jesus, he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And Lord Jesus, we are thankful as God's people that Jesus, you're the Lamb of God, shed your blood for us. And we're thankful for that day when by faith, we apply the blood of Jesus to our life. And we're thankful that the wrath of God will pass over us because of what Jesus did by giving His life blood on the cross of Calvary. Help us to share that message, to share it, tell our children about it. And Lord, to pray for those who are under the wrath of God 
that they too could come to know the Passover Lamb. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us for Wednesday in the Word today. Glad to have you. What a good group. I'm sorry we missed the last couple of weeks, but hopefully we'll be able to continue on, and uh, we'll pick up again uh, next week. God bless you. Thank you for being here.